welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Laura. I'm Kate. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today, we're discussing Matrix by Lauren Groff, a contemporary retelling of the life of 12th century poet Marie de France. It's the latest book read by Laura's Book Club. Published this past September, the book has been an immediate hit with fellow authors. Madeline Miller calls it lush, gripping and ferocious, animated with sensual detail on every page, while Sarah Waters describes it as an audacious piece of storytelling full of passion, wisdom and magic. It has been a New York Times bestseller and a finalist in the National Book Awards. But never mind all that, what did Laura's Book Club make of it? Did it spark debate? And whether they loved it or loathed it, the big question is, was it a great book club book? Keep listening to find out as we're joined by friends of the pod, Phil Chafee and Sarah Oliver to discuss it. Phil, Sarah, great to have you back in the shed. Great to be here. Nice to see you again. Inspired by the Booker Show, where we had drinks and snacks, I just thought, wow, this is really nice having drinks and (laughs) snacks. So we've got a Breton, it's called Le Père Jules, and it's a pear cider that we're drinking, which felt like the appropriate tipple. From a monastery. I don't know if it is from a oh, monastery, you made up that but detail. it looked like sort of a bit monkish. I'm agreeing so. with the detail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're sipping on that. And well, it, it's the evening here. Laura's having a dry lunchtime over there in Vancouver. Sadly, very sadly. I cannot tell you how excited I am to discuss this book because I finished it and I was like, oh! to talk about this book with someone and i've had to wait i've had to wait now i have some people in a room with me first of all laura how did your book group come to choose this one well i was the decisive vote on this one i raised it you know sometimes at the end of book club we're in a bit of a rush so i said "Ooh, i really think we should read lauren groff's matrix i was already booked in to hear her speak at the vancouver writers festival and i knew that phil was very very keen (laughs) to read it So when I messaged the rest of the group, Phil hadn't been able to attend. He was the first to be like, yes, thank you. I'm so excited. Do you want to tell us what it's about? Goodness. It is a story about Marie de France, who was a 12th century poet. And in fact, that is all we know about her. There is no other information on the historical record. So Lauren Groff's starting point was to imagine who was this woman who had the education and the resources to write these very beautiful lays. She was definitely of the court, and that is the case here with our fictional Marie de France. But in this case, she's been exiled from the court. Eleanor of Aquitaine has sent her away, and she is now to be the abbess. Is she an abbess in the first instance? She's sent there to be the prioress. The prioress turns out to be like the kind of deputy. Yeah. And so we meet Marie de France just as she has been exiled from court, and she is to be the prioress of this run-down abbey with very little resources. The nuns are actually starving, and Marie de France is only 17 years old. She grew up in France. Um, She grew up under the auspices of these amazing women in her life. Her connection to Eleanor of Aquitaine is quite bleak with a modern lens put on it. Her mother was raped by a relative of Eleanor of Aquitaine. A bit unclear. Phil and I talked about this in book club. Prince, a king. But at any rate, she is this child whose royal heritage comes from an act of extreme violence against her mother. And yet nonetheless, she is raised by this powerful mother and these powerful aunts. And she comes from this unique legacy. And then she ends up in court. But she is a misfit there. She's not actually all that welcome. And she gets sent off. So we meet her just as she's coming through the rain by herself to this crumbled down abbey somewhere in the English countryside. And then the story goes from there, doesn't it? It does. But before we get into it, let's listen to a clip. The audiobook is published by Penguin Audio and narrated by Adjoa Ando. Later that morning, after the meeting, Marie goes into the warming room of the kitchens where her nuns are sitting upon their stools with the books they are meditating over in low murmurings. Among the nuns at the abbey, only Marie practices silent reading. And every time she does, it makes Godda shiver and protest shrilly at her witchy magic. Yet if there is no inner reading, how can there be any inner life? Marie thinks and imagines the cold, blowing desert that must stretch inside her sub-prioress. The obedentiaries sit closest to the fire in order of rank, and the child oblates shiver, farthest from the fire, nearest the cold. Marie closes the door behind her and does not move to take her seat in the place of greatest heat, but feels the chill wood against her back. 
When she will step forward, the nuns will hear of the new plans. She will share what she has been given. For now, she savours the vision inside her. The light through the windows is watery and angled so that it shines through the breath of the nuns as they read aloud, the rising breath silvering, the streams of word made visible, word transformed to ghost as it rises from these mouths. The noise in the room is a low, sweet hum without pause, the voices mixing so beautifully that the impression is not a tapestry of individual threads, but a solid sheet like pounded gold. With their heads bent over their books like this, their words palely shining, she understands that the abbey is a beehive, all her good bees working together in humility and devotion. This life is beautiful. This life with her nuns is full of grace. Marie sends a prayer to the Virgin in gratitude. And then she steps forward. They are stirred from their reading to look up at her. They see the remaining radiance of this day's strange woman tree vision shining out of her, and it casts itself like the light of a fire upon their raised faces. She begins to speak of her newest vision. I missed that from my intro, didn't I? That she has visions, and it's these visions that propel the Abbey forward under her leadership. She grows it to be something quite different from what it was when she arrived. It's absolutely a book that is centred on this character of Marie. Um, it travels from her early childhood all the way through to the end of her life. She is the focal point. She is the thing through which everything else spins. One of the things I really loved about this book was it seems like a straightforward linear narrative in a way. You know, girl down on her luck is sent to this awful abbey in the sticks and then kind of makes good, uses her intelligence and her abilities to gradually improve the place until she has it running really successfully and then continues to improve things and to extend her power in order to create this amazing safe community and this haven for these women who are in her charge. And that seems like a very straightforward arc. I mean, almost kind of an archetypal narrative. I can think of films where this is the plot. Sarah and I were talking earlier about the Studio Ghibli film, Spirited Away, which is very much the same kind of arc. Young girl ends up in this land where she doesn't know what she's doing and she's very confused and she has to kind of learn on her feet and then gradually makes good figures out how the systems work and then kind of triumphs. And I never don't want to read that narrative. I love that narrative. But just to go back to how she did it, there was some kind of magic in the way that she achieved it. It wasn't obvious to me how she was doing it. And I think perhaps it's something to do with the idea of a labyrinth, the idea of circles, of things circling around. But when I tried to pull it apart, thinking, why is this so good? Why am I enjoying this so much? I kind of couldn't. Did your book club get any nearer figuring out how it's done? Well, I had the strange experience, and I should make this caveat now, that I heard her speak about the book at the Vancouver Writers Festival in an interview with John Freeman, who's also an author and an editor. So she sort of explained the book to me beforehand, and I think that really detracted from my experience reading it. It's almost like I'd been given a manual. So to your point about this cyclical nature that maybe you're picking up on, she was explaining that she was picking up on the rhythms of life in an abbey and the prayer cycle and really trying to build in that cyclical storytelling into the narrative. And actually, <laughs> the interviewer, John Freeman, really grimaced at this point. Now I'm feeling a little bit prudish. But she said, we are used to plots that climax, that have a real climax. She's like, I was kind of thinking about what would be the female equivalent of a climax, where you might be going in circles towards something. So that was her explanation. And as I say, I feel like it almost detracted it for me, but maybe that's useful for you, Kate. Yeah, and also I think that's useful. Yeah, go ahead. Like that, but that gets into other points about the plot too. Sex. Yeah, <laughs> into non-lust, non-lust, and sex, and yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, the archetypal narrative you were talking about, Kate, climaxes. You know, four fifths of the way through the thing, and this basically she turns the Abbey around 
within the first third of the book, within the first quarter of the book. Yeah, that's so right. So you don't have that. No, that you're right. It's yeah. a very different narrative structure. And then you're just sort of like, well, what next? Yeah. <laughs> and that's where it gets magical, I think, because, you know, there's the maze, there's the sex, there's the meeting with Eleanor. There's only one in-person meeting. But it does feel, as Laura was saying, very cyclical. And that's where it just feels magical. And you're just sort of sitting in this place without the plot building to this climax at the end. In some ways, it's very grounded in reality. She uses the power structures that are available to her as a woman with royal blood. She has money. She has a certain amount of resources. And then when she is put into this position of power at the beginning, she's very young, but fairly quickly, she resigns herself to a situation, actually. I think at the very beginning, all she's thinking about is leaving and getting back to court to be close to Eleanor. But then very quickly, she resigns herself to a situation. It's like, well, OK, if I've got to be here, how can I make things better? And then she starts to discover her own agency in order to improve things. And it is grounded in, for me, very believable things. You know, the Abbey is owed rent from the people within its domains. And so she realizes, okay, well, someone just needs to go and collect this rent. There's another thing that struck me, which is when she goes there, there was this perverse logic that guided their decisions so that they would have the nuns who were least suited to doing a task assigned to that particular task, because this is the idea of almost like the mortification of the flesh, and that that's self-flagellation, that they should be somehow punished by doing the thing that they were least fitted to do. And she sort of looks at that and thinks, well, that's just ridiculous. Let's put the strongest nun on looking after the oxen, and let's put a sensible nun in charge of the cellar or whatever. So that element of it, I loved because there was this reality to it that felt very grounded and believable to me. I mean, did anyone else find that a stretch or was that? No, I found a quote that sums that up towards the end. She's looking back on her life and it said, she understood then that it didn't matter that the landscape inside her looked so different from that of her sisters. They had been taught to crave their own subjugation and she had not that they had believed things that she thought silently were foolish, unworthy of the dignity of woman. They were filled with goodness as a cup is filled with wine. Marie was not and could never be. Of course Marie did have a greatness in her, but greatness was not the same as goodness. And I think that this idea, she fluctuates too, you know, if we look at that as goodness and greatness, greatness being her lineage, her upbringing, her expectations, her access to managing people, and how she'd seen that done in her first 16, 17 years, and how she used that in running the Abbey. What I love about it, and what's cyclical about the book, and what plays with the archetypal, you know, constant growth, is that she reflects often. And I loved seeing how she came to new decisions and challenged herself and her leadership. I really liked seeing that. So you're right, like she built up the Abbey, Phil, and that was all done towards the beginning. But then she was thinking of, well, how does it decay? How am I challenged in this? How do I maintain it? Am I doing wrong? Am I overstepping? There was a section quite early on where I underlined it at the time and I wrote, would she have thought this though? It says, and it was true. The religion she was raised in had always seemed vaguely foolish to her, if rich with mystery and ceremony, for why should babies be born into sin? Why should she pray to the invisible forces? Why would God be a trinity? Why should she, who felt her greatness hot in her blood, be considered lesser because the first woman was moulded from a rib and ate a fruit and thus lost lazy Eden? It was senseless. Her faith had twisted very early in her childhood. It would slowly grow ever more bent into its geometry until it was its own angular, majestic thing. Now, this is quite early on in the book. This is page five. And at that time, I was like, really? Would she? I think she totally would. I I was like, would she, though? You know, a kind of young... 12th century woman. At that point, I was sceptical, but I have to say, it didn't take long before I was like, fine. I'm just, (laughs) I'm happy to go with this. It's absolutely fine. Well, all her heroines, all her heroes in her life are women, Mm. like, and they are wonderful and powerful. And she's constantly seeing them like, oh, you can't do that. You can't. Well, she's been told that she can do all these things. And then she's what, too ugly to sit at court. So she gets pushed aside. Because she's raised by her mother and her aunts, isn't she? And they go off on a crusade at one Mm -hmm. point. They're very independent, strong women. Mm -hmm. Which is why in the beginning, when she first goes to the Abbey, they check her genitals to make sure that she's a woman. (laughs) What's her name? Uh, Uh, Wevua? Yeah. She's the one who doesn't like her? Yeah. 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 I think so. Maybe it's Goda, but I think it's her who kicks her and gives her a bath, right? (laughs) And, uh, you know, they need to make sure they just need to check because she's big. She doesn't have any feminine beauty in her. 
which is and constantly she referred has a to high throughout. Sense of self worth, so she must be a man. Mm. <laughs> what I found so interesting, though, alongside the religion, so religion permeates their worldview, mm. but that's the kind of ideology that I've heard it described as the divine right of kings permeates their worldview. So she is a woman, but she is also a part because of her connection to the royal line. And that was true, I think, of her mother as well. So I didn't necessarily believe that she would have all those thoughts, Kate, but I very much understood why she felt so empowered, because she is actually surrounded by powerful women, not least Eleanor of Aquitaine, right, who exerts a very different kind of power. But as Phil told me in Book Club, you know, was one of the most significant people of the medieval age. There's no men in this book mm. at all. There's not one mentioned by name. I think Geoffrey Plantagenet is her father. He was married to Empress Matilda, came over to England, and then he's the father of Henry II, who was Eleanor of Aquitaine's I love the way the listeners, Phil, is looking but... at me like, of course you know this. <laughs> like, no eye contact you know the American. But, <laughs> but they never mention Geoffrey. They don't mention Henry II. They don't get named. And men barely even appear in this. I read this as Groff's response to the misogyny of the Trump era. This fantasy of this world of women who have created in this deeply misogynist medieval era created their whole separate community and life. And therefore, I'm not sure if she would have had those thoughts, a historical figure like this, but I don't think it matters that much. Well, what's really interesting is when I finished it, I was like, I just want to read more about nuns and Marie de France. And that's all I care about <laughs> is just finding out more about this. And so naturally, I looked to her source material and it's a book called The Care of Nuns by an academic called Katie Bougish. You can get the sample on Kindle, which is the introduction in which, in classic academic fashion, she basically sets out her argument. And so you can kind of get everything you need to know just from this introduction. And there were these abbeys in Britain that did have these strong female leaders and that there is concrete, actual evidence to show that they did have a certain amount of autonomy that they won from the church and that they were given a certain amount of discretionary powers Certainly in that area that gets quite involved in the religious rites later on, you know, whether or not Marie is able to give the sacrament and take confession. And there is some evidence, I think, to show that there was precedent for that anyway. And so when I was reading it at the time, I didn't know whether any of it was true or if it was all just total hokum, but it was believable enough for me not to mind. And then I was so pleased when I read that introduction and I found that there were these historical precedents, which is just fascinating. But interesting, you used the word fantasy there. Because I was thinking, I'm enjoying this so much. Am I responding to it as I would respond to a fantasy? It gets a little bit possibly fantastical when she starts to construct this labyrinth around the mm. abbey to protect it. And it's described in quite concrete physical terms, how they built it, how they changed the landscape to make access to the abbey very difficult and confusing for people. But nonetheless, it still felt like a fantastical was slightly it sort took of her a day mystical, to get through it herself, yeah. Yeah, element to me. And I was just a bit like, you know, if a dragon turned up at this point, I wouldn't be particularly surprised and I wouldn't mind. <laughs> it would be fine. <laughs> because it was a little bit in that kind of fantasy category in my mind. <laughs> or maybe a sexy Virgin Mary and Eve. <laughs> Is that less fantastical than a dragon? I mean, for me, the sex almost had the opposite effect. Now, we've had many a discussion on the podcast about books where I've been either slightly disturbed by the sex or really thrilled by the sex. <laughs> and this actually... <laughs> this fall? In this, well, this falls nicely in between because actually, for me, what I loved and which I think is so hard to do for novelists who are trying to write historical novels is to make it seem real. And I love the way that she grounded it in this world of physical sensations mm. and touch mm. and taste and smell. And to me, the sex was very much part and parcel of that. If you had this group, this enclosed community of people all living together for many, many years, it just made total sense to me that there would be attractions and it felt very natural and real. And I think it is fairly explicit, isn't it, that Marie herself is attracted to women. There's a clear relationship she has with her maidservant at the beginning and it felt a little bit that she had made a point of this attraction towards women being something that was part of Marie. But overall, I almost felt the sex didn't feel particularly like lesbian attraction. It just felt like human attraction. You mm. know, because the women were there, I could totally imagine falling in love with a woman if there were no men around and you were just a normal living, breathing human being with sexual urges. Do you know what I mean? That just made it nicely accessible to me. I was like, yes, I probably would also fall in love with a hot nun. Absolutely. And you sort of, <laughs> if you're going to have a fully homosocial environment, 
the question is, how are they not having sex? And so, of course, you have to. But I do think a huge plot point is she's in love with Eleanor. Yeah, uh, no, Vakuten, with her, right? with Marie. So she, Marie herself is, I think, yeah. pretty gay. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I think it talks about that. I think there are people who might just be, you know, Nest, the woman who runs the infirmary. The infirmatrix. Will help people feel the release of uh, <laughs> Climax. And I think for her, it's more of a bodily function. She's not, for example, I don't think she's attracted to Marie, but then someone comes who she is attracted yeah. to, and then she has a partnership with that person, and she shuts down shop. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. servicing ends. Yeah, <laughs> it's very upsetting. So Lauren Groff answered some questions about this at the Writers' Festival, and she was saying that there is very much historical evidence that there was same-sex sex happening at Abby's. She also put into context and just said there was no capacity or understanding that this could be a sin because the male structure of the church didn't see this as an activity. Like they did not see it as sex. If they even knew of it, it was just maybe women comforting each other or, you know, cuddling. They had no sense of female pleasure and therefore it couldn't actually be defined as a sin. And I know. So I, I really love that. Strange freedom yeah. to that. <laughs> Kate, the extract that we heard at the beginning, it's actually the same one that Groff chose to read aloud at the Writers' Festival, which is a funny coincidence. It is beautiful, isn't it? It just speaks to her ability to use language in a fresh way. And one of the things she said that struck me was that it took her a long time to understand what the sentence structure would be for this novel, which slightly blew my mind because I was like, sorry, what? As an artist, as a writer... She was adopting a different form of sentence to tell this story from, say, Fates and Furies, a book we discussed with Book Club a while back. So there's such care and attention in the language that I have always found very rewarding in her writing. Now, that said, I was the slight outlier in Book Club, except for Charlie, where we felt it was a little bit monotonous. Discuss. I didn't find it monotonous, but I would think that would almost be intentional because there is so much monotony in the abbey you go through and sometimes you just list the prayers i can't remember what they're all called now prime nun maten maten you go through that a few times and now she's 38 years old now she's 52 i liked that the passing of time and the slowness of it and i also think that marie blossomed in this environment because she accepted the monotony of it and the parameters of it and it gave her so much time to think and reflect and be the best leader that she could be the other thing, just in terms of the prose style, is there's no dialogue. All the dialogue is described, but not quoted. Yeah. And I thought that really added to the lushness of it. That's what I mean, maybe, about that magic. And I'm not good at analyzing things as I read them. You know, I just want to be swept along by the story and the characters, and I'm terrible at, like, looking at, well, how was this achieved? Mm. But even when I did almost slightly go back to it with a point of looking at it to try and figure out how she'd achieved it, to me, it just felt, I really felt this is a writer who is so good and she's getting better and better and better, yeah. I feel, with everything that she writes. It was one of those books where I enjoyed the story and I loved the characters, but there was also huge pleasure in the way it was done and the excellence of that. That was just really a joyful experience. You're not alone, Laura. Intermediate reader online called it disappointing saying the author is clearly a gifted writer, finally evoking time, place, and the inner life of the protagonist. But the story, such as it is, is very, very dull. It moves <laughs> at a snail's pace. I found myself wishing this short book would end soon and longing for Ken Follett. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I mean, come on. There you I, have it. I slightly take issue. I mean, there's quite a lot of action in it. I mean, at one point, they're defending mm. the abbey from the marauding townsfolk who are upset with them, and then someone's head gets chopped off, and the nuns are holding it up and pretending to be Judith. And, you know, there are these, <laughs> these aren't there? There are definitely these action set pieces. And then there's the, when she's having the, the menopausal flushes, and she's getting these mm. sort of hot flushes, and she's racing out in the middle of the night to throw herself into the lake and then coming out all muddy and then ending up having sex with another nun who's there. And, you know, <laughs> to me, it felt like there was a lot of action in this book. But there's something quite meditative about the way that it's written, perhaps, that yes. almost nullifies that. It's episodic. It reads like mythology more than a story with a peak, you know, a Kambala mm. novel. <laughs> mm. There's a through line and the tension builds and blah, 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 as we were describing at the beginning. And this is not that. In our book club, Charlie also found the present tense very ah. oppressive. 
I did not, but I can see I don't love things in the present tense. But he basically said after a quarter of the way through, he couldn't bear it because the present tense was so oppressive and he had to stop. Hmm. Yeah, and he's a pretty committed reader generally. So it speaks to kind of a, a low level irritation that overcame him. I think maybe it touches a void for some readers like myself. There's no male characters in it, but it doesn't feel like that's a gimmick. It doesn't feel like that's a movie in one shot or something like that. Of course, there are no male characters in it. It does make sense. So it's all women. It's this powerful woman. There's no families. There's no children to care for. She's not trying to build up through the workplace or whatever. And there's no sex with men. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> When, Maybe I haven't been able to read text like this because every novel that is about women has those things, has children in it, or it has the violence between family life and work life, or there's a sexy spy, or <laughs> I don't know, something like that. This isn't that. I watched a good interview between Lauren Groff and Gia Tolentino, and they talked about the idea that what she's done is she's separated the ideas, going back to the sex, sorry, the idea of the female orgasm. It's just pure pleasure. It's not related to sex with a man and then mm -hmm. the consequences of that being children and that there's something feeding back into this idea of fantasy that is the utopia isn't it for women <laughs> like the idea that we could just all have lovely sex and that there aren't any catches mm -hmm. <laughs> but of course of this period in this time women you know i it's a little known fact about me that i have a medieval studies degree i did english and medieval studies at university and um <laughs> I know, but the thing is, you know, I've confessed that I found the medieval, unlike Lauren Groff, who clearly was fascinated by it and I think has studied French medieval texts and is obviously really into this world. But I have to confess, after we finished with Beowulf and the Anglo-Saxons, I just found it very boring. <laughs> but I did used to think to myself, because it all just seemed so grindingly awful for everybody who lived at that time. And the most exciting thing for them was to go to this brightly painted cathedral, because, you know, they always be these beautiful colours. And if that was, you know, everything was just sort of mud and grim. And if that was going to be the highlight of your life was going into the painted cathedral. I don't know. It always just seemed very <laughs> dispiriting to me. But I used to think to myself, if I had to live back then, it seemed to me the best option would be to be a monk in the scriptorium. And you get to be sitting there doing these lovely manuscripts as a graphic designer. I thought, oh, yes, that would be. I mean, I didn't know I was going to become a graphic designer, but that appealed. And then obviously, you know, if you couldn't be a monk, then to be a nun. Even then, I thought that was probably your best bet. But yeah, this fantasy of this female community that's enclosed, that's safe, that's flourishing, that has a strong leader, that's protected. I don't know. I just loved all that. It's not a utopia, though. Listeners who haven't read it might be thinking, oh, it sounds like a utopia. Like, Marie makes questionable decisions, doesn't she? And she is a little bit drunk on power. Mm. You know, she, does, she doesn't necessarily know when to stop. She becomes a bit morally compromised. Yeah. And that chimes with what Sarah was picking up on, which is these moments of reflection where she kind of acknowledges that to herself. Yeah, but mm. then she still doesn't quite stop herself. It's not something that she then changes, which makes her, I think, a more well-rounded character. She's not perfect at all. She does overstep. I compared her to Thomas Cromwell, as depicted by Hilary Mantel in Will Fall and Bring Up the Bodies. You know, a feminine version of Thomas Cromwell sitting at the middle of this web, in her case, it's the Abbey, pulling levers all over Europe to preserve their sanctity, right? Because there's lots of people who want that land or who don't like what they're doing. And also the initial increase of wealth of the Abbey is she's turning up the pressure on the serfs to give her their money, right? So mm -hmm. she is in this very iniquitous system. There's this running thread, isn't there, about her relationship with Eleanor, Queen Eleanor, who she falls in love with at a very early age. And she's always hoping that Eleanor, it's kind of a dance between them throughout the book. And I love that. There was a little bit of nice, will they, won't they? For me <laughs> oh their conversation when they get together in that mm. scene mm. is so good mm. it's so scathing it's just tons of read between the lines and politeness and but they're cutting each other to shreds going back to the online reviews roman clodia gave it two stars and said i would venture to say that the less one knows of marie de france and her writings the easier it might be to fall into this book in fact, the hook of Marie de France is precisely that, a hook on which to hang a story that could have been about any modern fantasy of a powerful medieval woman's life. It doesn't really touch base with what we learn about the real Marie from her writings. And John Anderson agrees and said Groff needs to tighten her narrative and decide whether she's writing a historical novel or a feminist dream text. I mean, I mm. thought it was interesting. It seemed like where people were having issues with it, people who maybe knew a lot about this period or 
were more familiar with the source material were finding it frustrating that it wasn't accurate enough. I very much felt, especially having heard her speak about her research and the work that she did, that she absolutely knew what she was talking about and that she had done a ton of research and was very expert in her subject matter. And to me, it felt very much like what she as a novelist had chosen to pull out and what she'd chosen to leave behind. It's not trying to be a real account because nobody knows. That's the brilliant thing. I think that's a fair point, though. I don't know anything about this time period, really, and I really enjoyed it. But I do see there's a constant argument of historical fiction is how much can you fictionalize something, especially if the fictionalized version becomes more prevalent than the primary text, then you're rewriting history. Mm. You I mean, might... she's so far removed, right? She's not anybody's grandma yeah. or whatever. <laughs> that, I mean, it's, the complaint's a bit more mooted, but if she were my grandma, I, you know, I might be upset with some things. I was going to say the false note for me came towards the end when she gestures towards the present day and climate change. It's not that it shouldn't be there, but, you know, <laughs> the climate crisis is in the headlines all the time. So then to find it at the end of my 12th century fictional novel, I was just like, oh, come on, Groff. Really? Can we not just spend some time here back 800 years ago where it wasn't a thing? That's interesting because I was looking at that too. I've only not read Fates and Furies, but I've read Arcadia, Delicate Edible Birds, Florida, Monsters of Templeton, and this one. She writes a lot about nature. She really likes nature. And also, as an American, coming to England, it's really noticeable that there aren't any real trees here, or forest or old wood, because they've all been cut down. And this was around the time when that was really happening. And she really cuts down a lot of trees. <laughs> so yeah, I was thinking that was a real time when this country, England, was changing mm. in terms of deforestation. Yeah, and she floods a field too, doesn't she? With dire consequences. Yeah. No, that was all right for me. It was more just that allusion to the present day. It felt a bit on the nose, a bit less subtle perhaps than mm. what she was able to accomplish elsewhere. We should talk about whether or not it was a good book club book. As ever, when us four get together, I think we kind of prove whether or not something's a good book club <laughs> book. We put it to the test in action. But I think it definitely was. It was a book that lots of people wanted to read. It was a book that almost everyone enjoyed quite a lot, except maybe for Charlie and me. And as I say, I put the caveats in that Lauren Groff had told me about the novel beforehand. And I don't really like that. Kate and I talk about this a lot. I don't really like the author telling me about their book mm. before or after. I appreciate their talents and their hard work, but I would like to have a relationship with their book as a standalone object. And then also I was reading really quickly and surely listeners will understand from the conversation that this is a book where you should take your time and be wrapped up in that flow to appreciate it. Oh, I don't know. So I think I was reading it in bed. I'd sort of stolen away from my family. I read upstairs in my room because that's the only place I can go where people leave me alone. And then my husband came in and started quite ostentatiously, I felt, packing for this trip that he was going on the next day. So he starts throwing things in the suitcase. And then I could hear the other children yelling at each other in the living room. And then our youngest howling and coming up the stairs. She didn't see me, <laughs> but she was just standing in the doorway. Like she didn't know where I was. And I just found myself able to keep reading. <laughs> I was just like, you know what? Hiding I'm, behind your Because labyrinth. it's exactly the opposite of where you are. <laughs> That's what's reading. attracting us yeah. to this text. Until someone literally tears the book out of my hands, I'm going to keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, when I looked online, it was very, very easy to find lots of positive reviews. Caroline Lawrence calls it genius, saying, I've never read anything like this, and I loved every sentence. As an author of historical fiction, I especially loved the mud and fleas and miasmas and excess of humours. Also the passions, visions, food, clothing, rituals, animals, relationships and battles. It's books like these that make me want to write more. Brava Lauren. And Amanda Jokinson called it an original and often surprising narrative, one which I found totally compelling and intriguing. 12th century life with a contemporary twist. These women come alive on the page in all their complexity, and the book is an extraordinary glimpse into a world long gone. I love that. I love that she made these women living, breathing creatures who really existed for me. It's hard. And even having done medieval studies, one of the reasons I find it so dry and unexciting is because it's so remote. It's very hard to put yourself back there in that mindset. And the interesting thing about the Anglo-Saxon poetry is that that is all very immediate and kind of really grabs you. It's very punchy and beautiful and in this language, which in itself is a pleasure to get to know. And all of that's really exciting. And then you get to the medieval period and it suddenly becomes this incredibly dry 
liturgical texts and okay there's Chaucer but apart from that <laughs> and so I just love this so much I thought my god if I'd read this when I was doing medieval studies I mean it could have just totally changed the entire three years of my life <laughs> <laughs> I'd got very into my nuns for me it was a total pleasure I loved it for book club I just think it's the perfect length and it has so many layers to dig into I mean we could I feel easily talk about it for another hour Absolutely. very happily yeah. So well done, Phil, I should say, for making your book club read it, which then made me read it. I think I probably would have got around to it eventually, but it's nice that this really nudged it up the agenda for me. And after all that, we never talked about the names. The names are a little bit hard to get your head around in the book. They're very unfamiliar names, the sort of Wolf Hilda and Wevua, and not quite sure how to pronounce them. And I read that she took them from the roles of the abbeys of Barking and Shaftesbury, so that these are genuine names from this period that people would have had. And I love that. And the other thing you get is the flavor of she is a Angela and Norman, and they're all Anglo Saxons, right? So you get that huge class divide as well. Because there's this mixture of languages, isn't there? That, you know, they're all speaking French. Mm. Yeah. Phil tells me that apparently everyone spoke French. Well, so the upper classes. Uh, the royals. The so. royals. Yeah. No, no, I, that's all I know. That's <laughs> all I had to learn from my citizenship test. <laughs> I wanted to read this quote, too, because it kind of sums up the book a bit to me. Also, she's looking back on her life about how much pain she was in when she first came to the Abbey. You mm. know, she was thrown out of court by the love of her life, Eleanor, who didn't really, it was unrequited. And she's thinking about over that time. And then she smiles at this version of herself at the time of pain, so young that she believed she could die of love. Foolish creature. Old Marie would say to that child, open your hands and let your life go. It has never been yours to do with it what you will. And I think this book is just about accepting that. So good. I never want to stop talking about <laughs> Matrix by <laughs> <laughs> I know. I feel like we could start all over again. Inspired by Matrix, here are some more books for your next book club read. Laura, do you want to go first? In book club, I mentioned this, and it is The Western Wind by Samantha Harvey, which The Guardian describes as a deft medieval whodunit. What I remember most about this fairly thin novel is the setting, which is 12th or 13th century Somerset, a small village in March, and it is cold. And it is wet and it is muddy and it is gray. And Kate, I think you said it. Why would these poor human beings who had to live through these conditions? Oh, you're saying maybe you had wanted to be a nun. Well, if you wanted to be a nun, surely, you know, if you're going to be specific in your daydream, you'll want to be thinking about like the south of France rather than medieval England, where there was no protection from the weather. Anyway, it's Samantha Harvey's fourth novel, and it very, very much captures the miserable conditions. Also the claustrophobia, because you would not leave your village. You might know 150 people or less, and that would be the extent of your social circle. And the story here is that a pivotal citizen has died. They've been caught up in this free-flowing river and they're trying to find out what happened. And if it was suicide, the consequences of that would be huge for the individual's ability to reach heaven. Where would they be buried? Hence the deft medieval who done it. There's this sense that they need to find out what has happened. And our main character is John Reeve, the priest. And he's being tasked to find out what happened. He's talking to everyone. He's walking around this wet, damp, miserable village. It's also the structure of time in this novel is a bit different. There's a lot to discuss. I think it would be a great book club book and would take people out of modern day into a different time where we can imagine living ourselves even with great trepidation and dread. I have a copy of The Western Wind. I've just pulled it off my shelf, which I got because you've recommended it before. Yeah, I saw it in the Oxfam bookshop, but I haven't got around to reading it yet. Once again, I'm thinking, oh, it sounds so good. I must read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in the mindset. Yes. Now is the time. Sarah, how about you? 
I was just thinking about more Lauren Groff. Some of the setting of this book reminded me of Arcadia, which is her novel about a utopia that some people try to put together. I think in the 70s, in it, there's a birthing center, and it's through the eyes of a little boy who narrates it, and you kind of go through his life. But like the setting of The Matrix, it's an enclosed community. There are things about it that are wonderful, and then there are things about it that are quite awful in that community and how it goes awry. So that's just an interesting place to go next. But I would say, even though I really enjoyed this, I have usually found her short stories to be better than her novels. Huh. And I really loved Florida. I love nature. I love being outside. And Lauren Groff just does a great job with that. You're taken to a different place. I mean, you're always in Florida, but you're taken to a very different location and different characters every time. And it's just beautifully written. And I'd recommend just sitting down with Florida, especially in the winter. It's an escape. I do love a short story collection for book club, too, because there's lots of different threads to unpick. How about you, Phil? What have you got for us? I have a, <laughs> a tome to recommend. Inspired by, I read this very differently than you. I just dipped into the graph every couple nights over the course of a month, because I just thought it was so pleasurable to just sort of dip into this beautiful world and then save it. And because it was episodic, I wasn't desperate to find out what happens next. And because I am also a big a medieval history geek, I'm going to recommend this book by Johan Twizinga, who was this Dutch medievalist from 100 years ago, who wrote this book, Autumn Tide of the Middle Ages, about, do you know this? No, I'm just smiling. Oh. <laughs> this is amazing. No I'm fascinated. No one's read this. <laughs> well, Except Phil. <laughs> it's something I've been dipping into for a couple of months. It was recently retranslated and Leiden University Press put out this beautiful edition of it. This is not about the exact same period. It's about Burgundy in the 14th and 15th century. This looks like a, it's a bit of a coffee table book. It's, it looks, a, yeah, it's about basically. a thousand pages long. It's got a bookmark. <laughs> but it's also absolutely gorgeous. And it's filled with, I mean, his descriptions, he's talking about the culture and the society of Burgundy in the 14th and 15th centuries, but there's poems in there. And then the edition itself is just every page filled with these beautiful prints and... Manuscript illustrations. And, yes. Yeah. So... I recommend this not on Kindle. I'm getting it's an investment, but it's one of my favorite books and it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, amazing. Definitely it would satisfy my need I have now to read more about this period. Absolutely. I wish I paid so much more attention during my <laughs> medieval studies degree when for three years I had access to the finest texts and the greatest academic minds in the field. <laughs> I wasted it feeling grumpy that I wasn't doing Beowulf anymore. <laughs> I sometimes struggle slightly to find or you know there are books where I feel like oh, I have to think quite hard about finding something that I feel has a kind of connection with the thing that we've just read whereas turns out nuns is a very rich <laughs> fruitful theme perhaps unsurprisingly I think lots of women writers have been interested in exploring this and a couple of people on Instagram you recommend a book by Sylvia Townsend Warner called The Corner That Held Them which I started it's a sort of proper novel so I couldn't skim through it and I was enjoying it it feels a bit darker than the Groff maybe a bit more realistic and also there are men in it <laughs> so, <laughs> and somehow that post Groff that felt disappointing to me <laughs> But funnily enough, we just discussed Lolly Willows by Sylvia Townsend Warner for Book Club. We haven't got that episode out yet. So actually, it was nice to be reading a bit more Sylvia Townsend Warner. But I wanted to recommend a book called Black Narcissus by Ruma Godden, which I did for Emily's Walking Book Club, which is the book club that my friend Emily runs on Hampstead Heath. So you go and you get to walk in the fresh air and you get to talk about these books. And she's very good at picking them. I like this line I found online about it. If you like your nun stories with plenty of sexual tension then this is for you. And I'm like, I only want to read nun stories now that have got sexual tension. <laughs> Five nuns travel to a region in the Himalayas to establish a convent school in a palace that was once a harem. They have high expectations of being able to do good, to minister to and convert the local population and to educate and provide for the poor. The English agent that they meet when they get there, employed by the landowners, Mr. Dean, turns out to be a dissolute sort of individual who tells them that they are wasting their time. Like the monks who came before them, their efforts are doomed to failure. It's incredibly atmospheric. Ruma Godden grew up in colonial India and I think just you sense, you know, she really knew what she was talking about. The dynamics between 
these people coming in, these Westerners with all these ideas about religion and saving people. And then the local environment that they're coming into is just brilliantly nuanced and very well done. There's a lovely bit of simmering sexual tension between Mr. Dean and the main nun, Cloda. And there's a really moving thread about their hopes and their aspirations and in a way perhaps their naive expectations and how they have to come to terms with the reality of being there and then there is a sense of mysticism and spirituality the tension between the ideas that they're taking with them through the religion that they have been brought up with and learned almost their intellectual idea of religion and then this landscape that they're in you know the himalayas this mountain that's looming over them and how that affects them it's really good and it made for a great book club book because again there's just lots there and it's quite a good story i also was recommended by elizabeth morris who's been on the pod before who writes the crib notes newsletter and my friend chrissy ryan who was here for our booker episode so i was with those two and they said you must read this book called margaret the first by danielle dutton which i'd never heard of they both said it's brilliant and you know what they were right it is so good. It's a work of historical fiction about an interesting eccentric poet, philosopher and writer in the middle of the 17th century, Margaret Cavendish. She was married to William Cavendish, who was a duke. She came from this aristocratic background and she married well. So then she was in a position of affluence. Phil, it sounds like you would really be able to very precisely place her in the historical <laughs> context of the um it was Cromwell and the restoration and I think things that helped anchor it for me was Samuel Pepys and the Great Fire of London it's yeah. that time period okay. like Groff she is absolutely brilliant at evoking it all the senses and this character is incredibly eccentric relatively well documented there's more about her that we know and she was an author she was one of the first women to make her living through her writing which was very shocking and frowned upon at the time but because she was so eccentric she actually became a huge success and she wrote this sort of crazy science fiction novel again a little bit with a kind of theme of female empowerment i think mm -hmm. it, it just, this is uh, fascinating it sounds so cool utterly brilliant. <laughs> it was so so good Hannah Greendale, reviewing it over Goodreads, calls it a melodic portrait of an unconventional woman who boldly destroyed the shackles of sexism and braved social criticism in exchange for the freedom of being her true self. And I mean, I oh. only want to read about this right now. And this book was so great. And I was just like, how can I never have known about where was I? Was I in a cave when it came out? It came out in 2016. She's American. The author? What's the author's name again? Danielle Dutton. But I mean, Lit Hub. They knew about it. They nominated it one of their 20 best novels of the decade or something. So I wow. just, and Chrissy and Elizabeth, who were a lot more switched on than me. Anyway, they told me, I read it. It's amazing. I now pass it on to you. I think it would be so great for book club. If you're not doing Matrix, you should do this. Is it less than a thousand pages? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did I not say? It's really short. It's like 120 pages. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when you finished Autumn Tide of the Middle Ages. I'm going to say the gold bookmark is like on page 15. <laughs> Johann Hutzinger. <laughs> you can read Margaret the First. That's all for this episode. Our book recommendations were The Corner That Held Them by Sylvia Townsend Warner, Florida by Lauren Groff, Autumn Tide of the Middle Ages by Johann Huizinga, Black Narcissus by Ruma Godden, and Margaret the First by Danielle Dutton. The Book Club Review podcast is produced and edited by me, Kate Slotover. Our audiobook was kindly provided by Penguin Audio, narrated by Ajoa Ando, and available for download from online audiobook retailers. Our musical interlude was, of course, O Frondens Virga by Hildegard von Bingen, 12th century German Benedictine abbess and polymath, active as a writer, composer, philosopher, mystic and visionary. If you enjoyed this show, check out our website, where you can find our archive of over 100 episodes to browse through. Everything from reading Proust with the Proust Book Club, to discussions of bestsellers like Where the Crawdads Sing, and lesser-known gems from the backlist. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what we do, please do take a moment to rate and review the show. It helps other listeners find us. Better yet, tell a friend. If you enjoy this episode, pass it on. Share it with someone else that you think might enjoy it too. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>